James Mulholland walks his own meadow, land his people have farmed for generations. From Killeshandra and Butler's Bridge to Lispelaw and Enniskillen, the map of Ireland is a filigree pattern of blues and greens, as whorled and as intricate as any design in the Book of Kells. Blue for lake, green for deep meadow, a dreaming, sighing land. Until northeast of Lisnesky, the colour changes to brown, the Fermanagh countryside rises into rough moorland. This is Esh Brally Mountain. There were ten children in the Mulholland family. Four of them went out into the big world. An exact way to describe leaving a place so blessedly secluded and so self-contained. Six stayed in the home place. Four brothers, Daniel, the youngest, Frank, James and John. Two sisters, Mary and Margaret, strong, quiet people whose hearts are bound closely to the homestead, the land around it, and the fruits of that land, which are not, as you will see, confined absolutely to the conventional farm produce. Then up. Self-containment, self-sufficiency are two of the chief marks of the Mulholland farm, their own poultry and cattle, butter, eggs, turf. Sister Mary steps out to fill the food trough for the free roaming hens, whose eggs always seem to have a better flavor than those of the regimented modern birds. No glittering newfangled machinery here, nor is the absence felt as any deprivation. Fine flocks of geese and a pet of a gander feeding out of a pot are rare sights nowadays anywhere in rural Ireland. And after the milking, the cows go lazily back to pasture. Frank Mulholland standing there Dan following the cattle along a lane secretly curtained and perfumed with bushes and brambles. A place for children to play at outlaws and pirates, the haunted country lane of everyone's childhood. And good currant bread and home churned butter with beads of crystal bubbles glimmering on it were all part of that rural childhood if you were country reared or lucky enough to have relations in rural places. Butter may still be the cream, as we are told so often, but butter made in the old way in the home dairy or the spotless farm kitchen was the creme de la creme. The churn that Mary Mulholland uses is in the family for a century. Think of all those churnings and rinsings and scaldings and coolings to guarantee the purity and the flavour of the butter. She handles the dash and the joggle with an ease and skill that is instinctive, at least inherited. This is how she saw her mother do it, how her mother saw her mother do it. And every expert woman at the churn, like every good ballad singer, develops special personal skills, little touches, variations, grace notes. Carefully she scalds the colander. Collects the floating butter. Drains off the buttermilk. Washes the butter with clear spring water. Moulds the fragments into unity with the joggle.
uses a scallop shell in the salting. The sea the shell came from is only a step west over there, beyond the reaches of the urn. Mary shapes the pats of butter by hand on a breadboard. No fancy ornamented paddles here, but the clean shape of the pure butter, in the style of those great rugby footballs of butter, that even in English-speaking districts were known as miscons. From the fresh churn to the flaming forge would seem a long journey anywhere, but here on Eshbrally you can make it in a minute. Frank said they never bought a hundred of coal in their lives, except the exception meant for the forge. Not a customary piece of equipment on every Ulster farm, but here it is, you might say, the heart of the matter. For first and foremost, the Mulholland men are stonecutters, and have been so for a long time. James Mulholland delicately draws out the point of a punch so that it can mark the pliable stone as exactly as a pen. Frank at the forge works the circular fan, tempering the heat to suit the nature of the metal they are using. A different heat moulds a different metal and they pick up their raw material anywhere, scraps, Bits of an old, disbanded automobile, nothing goes to waste. Through fire and water, dull, lifeless metal is translated, transmuted, into the sharp edge that will master the stone. There's fine bread that, you might say, can speak for itself. And it's enjoyed here with strong, fragrant tea by the family getting ready for the day's work. The breakfast table is a good place for thinking and planning, each one to his or her own particular task. From the morning outside come the farmyard noises, sinking back into the peace of the countryside. When the farm chores are done and the tea taken, it's away to the quarry across a mile and a half of meadow and moorland. There is something special about this walk, and the dogs, as they race ahead of Frank, John and Dan, seem to know it. The Mulholland Quarry, in use for a century and a half. Ferns grow out of a crevice in the soft sandstone, Tennyson's flower in the crannied wall. Tadpoles live in the quarry pool. Jem Mulholland, the grandfather, worked this quarry, walking from the homestead along the same field path, the ancestors of those dogs, more than likely, dancing around him. The narrow plank bridge sways beneath the men as they step into what you might call their studio, a pocket of sandstone on the fringe of the urn basin, which is composed mainly of limestone. 
With the delicate punch, the stone is bottomed. Holes are made to take the metal wedges. Fragments or spoil, the local name is scablings, are swept away. The stone opens, it would seem easily and evenly, like slicing bread. That, I suspect, is why it takes eight or ten years to learn the craft, one of the oldest practised by civilised man. No young lads learning the job nowadays, John says. It takes too long to learn and the future is too chancy. I left school at 12, Frank says, there was the farm and the quarry. At that early age, he started at the making of the scythe stones. At that time, there were 10 or 15 men working at the stones. Against the spread of antiquity, not to talk of evolution, it seems trivial to talk in terms of centuries. But Frank Mulholland can talk of quarries in this locality that have been worked for 400 years and have sent a stone, as he puts it, to the building of cathedrals. Then it's back across the bending plank bridge. The stone is on its way to the banker, the stonemason's name for the support the stone is placed on to work it. On the banker, the stone is scribed to draw lines on it, in fact, as in the Latin, to write on it with the long punch. They cinder the stone, which is the twist the Ulster accent gives to sunder. The blocking hammer roughly shapes the stone, and out of the oblong block, the fish-like shape of the whetstone emerges. The Greeks saw their statues and blocks of marble long before chisels were put to them. John takes over now. The whetstone is held in position in a trough. When John Mulholland started to work, the whetstone sold at two shillings a dozen. Now it's six pounds a dozen. But tobacco was then eightpence an ounce, an old money. Now it is 62 pence. That's how the world changes.
one year Frank and his father made 1,700 scythe stones, and some of those stones were sent as far away as the USA. They worked by lamplight in the winter evenings. It must have been a grand sight, the lamps dotted around the quarry and the tap, tap, tapping, chip, chip, chipping of the hammers. That preliminary smoothing by the claw chisel is the one concession to modernity or factory made tools. The wooden mallet is made from Ulster crab apple. The final scraping and shaping at the wooden stake is done by a scythe blade. Those stones will sharpen many a scythe. Once they made millstones, but now all the old mill wheels are gone in this new ersatz world. But the whetstones and the grindstones and the crazy paving are still in demand. Across the mountain from over by Five Mile Town and Grogi comes Tom McCaffrey to buy a whetstone. Hello, Mr. Mulholland. Hi, how are you, Tommy? Not so bad at all, mate. Well? Not bad at all. That shower is as well, isn't it? Aye, there's a spit broken like Aye, it is. I might see the man up here. I don't believe now we're going to have a lot of rain. Ah, they might not, now. They may not, now. Well, you are still working at the side stones? I would do with you, little lad, all the time, too, and more on that crazy work or building work. Yes, so we're seeing it. Aye. I suppose you would have one to spare now. Or... Ah, well, we would uh, have one to spare, aye. Well, that would be okay now, for I could, I could be doing with one. Aye, uh, I'll get you one. All right, well, now. Decent man now. Thank you now, that's... <coughs> that'll do my that'll job. That'll have to put on some edge for you. Uh, that'll do my job, it's something that I just need now. Aye, yeah, surely. At the... At... The day of this sale, it's, coming, it's coming into this time of year that these are needed to get over. But they don't go often, don't go wrong. They can sharpen knives on even they don't be sharp on a side. Yet. Oh, yes, that's Aye. right. They're great. They can sharp many a tool for Oh, they can, that's right. Oh, oh very useful now. Very, very useful now. How much is that? Uh, 50 pence, Tom. Oh, well, it's not breaking on that if a no. man would happen to have it. <laughs> you have some, anyway, sir. I suppose. Will that near me, Right, thanks, yeah, boss. Thank you, mate, very much. Thank you, mate. And for Tom, it's back to Grogi and Cunyin, once famous for its ghost, the only Irish ghost that ever emigrated, but that's another story. From the tea break, under that roof of scraws and heather, and with the echoes of music and talk in his ears, Frank looks down on his countryside, one of those deep-hedged, slumbrous valleys that give that area and the Clogher Valley a very special quality.
Here is the Spelador, the moor, the sound of whose scythe is heard whistling in Gaelic poetry, and for that matter in the poetry of every language man in grasslands has ever spoken. Once men walked miles over the mountain by boreens and field paths to gather for the hunt. There's hardly a house on the moor or in the valley that has not at least two hounds to hunt the hares and the foxes. At this time of year the hounds are kept carefully on the lead to protect the young hares from over-enthusiastic and unplanned pursuits. That horn of clear voice is well known in these hills. It was fashioned by Dan's grandfather, Jem Mulholland. Is still the same as in the days of Finn and his Fenians. When the saga tells us they followed the hunt in one day from Slieve Trim, on one side of what is known as Tyrone, to the shores of Loch Ney on the other side. Ah. Uh -huh. 